the latest in a string of tell-all books about US President Donald Trump released in recent months. Rage by Bob Woodward has caused an explosive reaction even before the date of its release. The 480-page book hit bookshelves this week, revealing details of President Trump's 18 conversations with the award-winning investigative journalist known for the coverage of the Watergate scandal and the 9-11 terrorist attacks. From the US leaders' handling of domestic issues like the COVID-19 pandemic and racial injustice to the administration's foreign policy, details from the book have been making headlines this week. And today we go over some of the most contentious points. For this, we connect with Tim Shorrock, an investigative journalist at The Nation who has uncovered truths about US involvement in the Gwangju democratization movement in South Korea. We also have Mark P. Barry, associate editor of the International Journal on World Peace, who's been following North Korea for more than three decades. Now my first question to you, Mr. Sherrock. So President, President Trump's handling of this ongoing COVID-19 pandemic is perhaps one of the most contentious points in this book. Trump has said con constantly that it's going to go away in spring and that it's just like the seasonal flu. But of course, the months have proven otherwise. And Woodward's book reveals that the president was very well aware of just how deadly the virus is and how transmissible it is. Of course, your president defended himself very recently, saying that he didn't want to cause panic and that he tried to downplay it, and that he'd promptly close borders to Chinese and European travellers. But do you think this reasoning makes sense to you? No, not at all. Uh, actually, what President Trump did was the very opposite, because you know he, he has been very discouraging of things like using masks, and he has rejected a lot of the science, and he's made statements that are just flatly untrue and causing extreme confusion, I think. And at the very beginning of the crisis, when you know, different states were in lockdown and people came out and were, were demonstrating to demand to you know, not be locked down and to be able to do what they wanted to do in public uh, and rejecting the state you know, the, the, the state's interests in keeping people at home and keeping people isolated, uh, he's encouraged that. You know, he tweeted, you know, free Minnesota when there was a demonstration in Minnesota and this kind of thing. And so he actually egged a lot of people on to reject what his own scientists and his own health authorities were saying. So, and, and these statements show that he knew very early on, and you can read in this book that the very first pages are about how he was informed of what a very serious uh, kind of d disease and pandemic this could be and was going to be. And he knew very well that it spread through the air, uh, yet he really played down that danger. And, and he yeah. continues to do that. And even in the recent rally, he said that on November 4th, all lockdowns might be eased. And well, it seems that he's carrying on with this uh, um, this you know, line he's taken against COVID-19. And well, Mr. Shaw, all these revelations, they were taped by Bob Woodward, who kept this in the, under the covers for months before the release of his book this week as one huge spoiler. As a journalist, do you think that's right to you? I mean, does this raise questions about Woodward's journalistic integrity and duty to the public? Uh, it, it, it's a hard issue because, you know, a lot of times, has been, has been pointed out that when people do write books, uh, a lot of times people talk knowing that the book's going to come out, you know, in a year or two years, and they're freer to say what they, they feel rather than, you know, they know it's going to be in a news story the next day. So sometimes it's important to protect your sources for that, that period of time where you're waiting for the book to come out. On the other hand, this information was very critical, I think, for people to, for people to learn. Perhaps you could have broken that out as another story before the book came out. So I'm kind of of two minds on it, but I actually do think that he should have revealed this er earlier before his book came out. It really could have shaped how the COVID-19 pandemic uh, response could have been, I be well, personally speaking, but... Well, I, I agree, I agree. I, and I think if people knew that, you know, as he was telling Bob Woodward, that this could be easily spread in the air, and that it was much dangerous, much more dangerous than the flu, I think people would have listened to that. But as I said before, he just egged on the opposition, people that didn't want to have controls. And I think that was a terrible mistake, and it very well may cost him the election. 
And well, Dr. Barry, now let's get to you. What was your initial reaction upon reading this book? And do you think this, this book does talk quite a lot about North Korea? Do you think it offers any new insights into Trump's handling of foreign policy, particularly in regards to North Korea? Yeah, actually, in reviewing the book today uh, and literally going through every page and at least uh, reading the sections that dealt with North Korea uh, and, and scanning the rest, uh, I see things in a different context than just reading the excerpts that had been released last week. Uh, and I actually, I found the most important chapters uh, are the two chapters about three quarters of the way through the book where uh, Woodward interviews Jared Kushner. I think that has to be read by anybody who's going to make an informed decision uh, on election day in November. Uh, Jared describes exquisitely exactly the perception and media management that his father-in-law is engaged in. And it's not simple. It's actually uh, intricate, uh, while at the same time being shoot from the hip. And therefore, that informs everything that President Trump uh, says to people like Woodward on subjects such as COVID or, or on North Korea. So that's the larger context. So those two chapters, to me, I think people need to read it and read it again and understand exactly what Jared Kushner is saying, because he's the one who's really running the White House. He's the de facto chief of staff behind the scenes. Everybody answers to him uh, except his father-in-law. Uh, but when it comes to you know, the handling of North Korea, um, it's obvious that the president is handling it uh, pretty much by himself. There really wasn't much of a role for Mike Pompeo to play. There really was little role, little role for John Bolton to play, and it was probably was just as well. Uh, but what it does reveal is that uh, the president, as a New Yorker, I saw him as a consummate high-priced real estate guy going after a foreign client and um, giving him what we call the schmooze job, which is just, you know, selling him on what we're going to do for you, but you got to give me something in return that will satisfy me. So it's really the art of the deal from the late 1980s brought up to 2018, 2019, and 2020 that really epitomizes the New York big shot real estate approach, particularly how he dealt with a foreign uh, prospective buyer. Well, perhaps it would help if the president was taking a security approach to foreign relations and not a business transaction approach. And well, Mr. Sherrill, the book, of course, again, it discusses um, how close the US was to being at war with North Korea, which is something you've tweeted about as well. But well, so from seemingly being at the brink of war to Trump bragging about his relationship with Kim Jong-un and all the cameras that had been at the Singapore summit, what does this book tell us about Trump's North Korea policy? I mean, has the drama and all the bromance that we've seen all come to a good conclusion? Has it been worth it? Well, in my opinion, yes, it's been very much worth it. And I think one of the few good things Trump has done, uh, particularly in foreign policy, you know, was talking directly to Kim Jong-un. I mean, I think that was the only way, you know, to cut through years and years of, of uh, problems in terms of the relationship and, and, and try to cut a deal uh, that would be fair to all. Uh, that was an important thing. And I, I disagree with so much of the media who always says that just this just gave you know, Kim Jong-un, uh, uh, you know, some kind of credibility on the world stage. I mean, uh, you know, he's the leader of North Korea, and that's who you have to talk to if you want to resolve a, a near war. So that's one thing. Uh, but the other thing I think is important about this book, and particularly that Woodward wrote it, is the fact that it does talk about the very, very critical role played in the peace process by South Korean President Moon Jae-in, and it makes it very clear that it was his, you know, discussion through his through his representatives with Kim Jong Un in in early 2008, where Kim Jong Un said he would be interested in meeting President Trump. That that message was conveyed, you know, to the White House, and Trump agreed. But Moon played a key role there, and that has really not been 
very well understood uh, by the U.S. media, in my opinion. And, and they, there's a lot of misunderstanding of South Korea's agency in this whole process. And so I think that's one of the important things about that, about Woodward's account. And of course, well, it did take a lot of determination, a lot of will, effort and planning from President Moon Jae-in to actually initiate all of this. But on President Trump's part, it seems that it was really up to really chance. And it, what's maybe concerning is that there doesn't seem to be much of a plan or logic behind his interactions with the North Korean leader. And Dr. Barry, of course, your president is the master of optics and a lot of surprises. But do you think this really is a sound strategy when it comes to dealing with North Korea? Yes and no. I say yes from the point of view that because of the unique regime dynamics in North Korea, all these problems have to be solved ultimately from the top to top level. So that said, I think the president had to decide, am I really going to ask him to give up all of his nuclear weapons or not. The president, because of his real estate business deal mindset, uh, I believe is incapable of uh, putting any stock in uh, a interim uh, and step-by-step -step deal, which is what uh, Kim Jong-un in, in one of his letters said. He wanted symmetrical, phased approach to uh, the nuclear uh, uh, denuclearization. And you really don't get the feeling that he was going to give up those, wep those uh, nuclear materials that have already been weaponized. Uh, and in return, neither does the president give a, an explicit uh, promise of, of, of what he's going to do uh, you know, at, the, at the end of the road. So basically, what, what Kim saw is that he does not have the ability to know uh, if anything he gives up will, will be given anything in return. Uh, it reminds me of how Kim Il-sung told uh, uh, Cambodia's King Sihanouk in the early 1990s that the Americans want us to take off all our clothes and disclose all of our defense secrets, and we can't do that. So that appears to be the, the essential framework of the president's approach. And so that's why there's been so little development on the working level, uh, a very little working level contact other than to set up these summits. And Dr. Barry, of course, behind these top level meetings, a lot of working level efforts were being made to make it all happen. And the book, of course, does describe a great deal of drama behind the scenes of US North Korea relations. How do you think Trump's presidency has changed the working level relationship? Has it been for the better? And how would a Biden administration, if things go differently in November, be different? I think. The U.S. could learn the, the, the good lessons from uh, the, the Clinton administration negotiations uh, that led up to the 94 agreed framework. They could learn from the George W. Bush administration's uh, efforts over the years, uh, 2005 to uh, eight, roughly with the six party talks. But at the same time, that needs to be meshed with uh, the, the top down approach. You really need both. And it has to be initiated at the top. So that's why I felt really over the last year that maybe uh, whoever becomes next president, whether it's uh, President Trump or Vice President Biden, that we need uh, more of a Camp David style approach where let's say the president invites Kim and staff, senior staff, to some one of the Hawaiian islands where there's good security and spend 10 days or two weeks and really hammer out an agreement and come up with something that's a real deal. And I think, I think Joe Biden really has little choice but to ultimately do something like, something like that as well, because he can't go back to the, the days of so-called strategic patience under Obama, which really was equivalent to benign uh, neglect. And before we go, Mr. Sherrock, we're used to hearing a lot of uh, sensational stories about President Trump. And to be honest, none of them really surprise us anymore. But how do you think this book will affect the U.S. president election on November 3rd? I think it'll mostly be around the COVID issue. I, I do think that that has affected a lot of people, including a lot of Trump voters. Uh, you know, I mean, this was, uh, lots of people died and suffered from this pandemic. Uh, and you didn't have to be Democrat or Republican or left wing or right wing to get this disease. And uh, people 
from all sides, kinds of life, you know, got this disease and suffered from it. And many, many people have died for almost at 200,000. And I think his denial of the seriousness of it continues. And his, his just refusal to recognize how many people have suffered and died. He just keeps saying, well, because of what I did, two million people didn't die. You know, but yes, sir, 200,000 people and probably a lot more are going to die. So I do think it's going to have an effect. And yes, definitely, the COVID nine, the way he dealt with the COVID-19 crisis and trying to downplay it using his own words, very questionable and it seems like it will be talked about a lot over the next coming weeks. And well, I'm afraid we're going to have to Put, um, we're going to have to wrap up the discussion here, but that was Tim Shorkin, investigative journalist at The Nation based in Washington, D.C., and Mark P. Barry, associate editor of the International Journal on Peace based in New York. Thank you so much for your insights. Thank, thank you. you. And to our viewers, as always, thank you for watching. We will be back at the same time tomorrow here in South Korea. Until then, have a wonderful day or evening wherever you are. Goodbye.